Well, thank you, Russ, and uh, thank you to the organization for allowing me to spend the next 20 minutes with all of you. So what will be the hot topics in IBD 2017? So I know we're running a bit late today, so I'll keep it brief. Here you go, and thank you very much. Have a good meeting. All right. So we did find a cure in Pittsburgh, as Uma has pointed out, but we won't go there this year. So what are the hot topics in 2017? And I think these are relevant not only to this meeting, as you'll hear more about this, but to all of your practices in the next year or two. What will biosimilars mean for us? What biologic therapy is the best now that we have more? What do care pathways mean and how will these be implemented by the payer and insurance company in your practice? And then finally, the changing healthcare landscape and what new models of care exist for IBD. So what will biosimilars mean for us? And I think you'll see much of the data tomorrow and the next day, but just to give you a flavor in terms of biosimilars, we've gotten used to biologic therapy, now come along biosimilars. So why do we even have this talk? Why don't we stick with what we know? Well, when you look at healthcare spending, this has grown faster than the rest of the economy in recent decades, and it's projected to increase even more. So one approach to healthcare costs is Russell Cohen's car, which is this. So this is what we've known and loved. But another approach, maybe we can get to the same place in my car, which is this. And again, you can decide which car is better. There have been a number of recent publications in the last year looking at biosimilars, and I'll just quote the one from ap and it is likely that biosimilars will be widely used for the treatment of IBD to their cost savings and comparable efficacy. Tina Ha and Asher Kornbluth also put together a critical re review looking at this, not only including regulatory guidelines, outcome, but big business. So biosimilars have been looked at by the CCFA and other organizations, and we now know that these are a similar copy to the originator molecule, and they should be the same in strength, route of administration, effectiveness, and safety. However, they are not identical. They are not an identical copy in every way. Just focus on the top of these, and I, I have these in your syllabus if you want the references, but there have been a number of studies looking at TNF binding affinity and neutralization between biosimilars and innovators, and they look the same. In ankylosing spondylitis and rheumatoid arthritis, CTP13, that's the biosimilar, looks similar to infliximab in terms of antidrug antibody and concentration. When we compare biosimilars to reference in healthy controls, and again, I don't expect you to read every study, but there really was no difference. The concentration levels between the two, also in ankylosing spondylitis and rheumatoid arthritis, were the same. What are the clinical efficacy data in a biosimilar to a reference anti-TNF? In italics below that, I think it's very important to realize these studies have been done in ankylosing spondylitis and rheumatoid arthritis, and we don't have the data yet in a head-to-head -head comparison with IBD. However, in these studies, there was no clinical efficacy difference between the biosimilar and reference anti-TNF in either ankylosing spondylitis or rheumatoid arthritis. So now biosimilars for nomenclature definition can be extrapolated to other indications. So the FDA, if it's approved for ankylosing spondylitis or RA, it can be extrapolated to other diseases such as Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. The billion dollar question though is can we interchange the biosimilar? And interchangeability would mean free exchange from innovator product to biosimilar could allow the pharmacies to substitute potentially without you knowing. This is subject to each state's individual laws on biosimilars, but ultimately the FDA determines whether a biosimilar is interchangeable or not. This is critical though. If you have an anti-drug antibody to infliximab per se, it does not and you should not switch to the biosimilar as you would anticipate the same immunogenicity. There are now two biosimilars in the United States approved for IBD, Inflectra 
and Mgevida, uh, both the biosimilar to infliximab and to um, adalibumab. These are not yet interchangeable. These have been studied in AS and rheumatoid arthritis, but extrapolated to Crohn's and ulcerative colitis and not yet commercially available, but they will be on the horizon. So how does biosimilars look, at, look in IBD? And again, without focusing on the table, just look really at the top. The clinical response ranges were wide, but most of the studies showed that over two-thirds of the patients had a response, and up to about two-thirds of patients were in remission. But again, no head-to-head -head studies in IBD. The other main question is, can we switch from one to the other? So this is the NORSWITCH study that was just presented at UEGW very recently, looking at switching from one to the other. So this was a phase four multi-indication, not just IBD, switching from infliximab to the biosimilar CTP13. And the bottom line is that the disease worsening at 12 months, that was the primary outcome, was about a quarter to a third in both groups. There was no difference. Antidrug antibodies were no difference. However, when you look at the fine print of the study and look at specifically Crohn's disease, you start to see numerical differences between the biosimilar and infliximab. But the concluding statement of the recent Annals of Journal of Internal Medicine, preliminary evidence supports the biosimilarity and interchangeability, and we can have a discussion about that, of the biosimilar and reference TNFs. So what does this mean for biosimilars for all of us? Are we comfortable with the extrapolation data? Is it okay that a biosimilar in, to start in a, na a naive patient to biologic? But what about switching? I think that's what most of us want to see. Most of us want to know, and we want to know if the pharmacies will be able to do this without us knowing. And then ultimately, what are the issues of immunogenicity with the biosimilars and cost? In the cost containment society that we live in, will these be cheaper, and if so, how much? However, I dare say we probably shouldn't take this approach to biosimilars because they are here and they will be in our practices very soon. So let's switch gears. What's the best biologic therapy? What's the best one in your practice? So we now have seven biologic therapies across three different classes of action, and we soon will have at least one, and if not two more, coming shortly. Physicians, payers, patients, all of us in this room would love to see prospective head-to-head -head comparative effective studies on biologics. Data are emerging, but we don't have that yet. And again, there have been a number of studies that have recently looked at in a retrospective fashion comparing these. So in this one study, just to orient you on the colors, vetalizumab is in blue, infliximab in red, green is adalibumab, and orange is seratilizumab, looking from reduction of induction of remission to maintenance to corticosteroid-free remission. You see similarities, but maybe there are some slight differences between the groups. Similarly, for ulcerative colitis, maybe we see for reduction, induction of remission in the red bars in fliximab numerically looks higher than the other groups, where the blue vetalizumab may look good for mucosal healing and maintenance. Comparative effective in fliximab and adalibumab. Ashwin put this together recently and published this in April had, and looked at comparisons. Again, not prospective, but culling the data. Hard to read the, the words, but I'll just point out, patient-reported outcomes were better with infliximab compared to adalibumab in both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Important outcomes in terms of surgery and hospitalization, though, were no different between the two biologics. And then finally, Sid Singh and others had looked at comparative effective in biologic naive patients. So this is what we all want to know, right? What's the best first biologic therapy to use? So they looked at biologically naive patients and they started them on an anti-TNF uh, therapy and they followed them and, and decided how they looked. This is a health administrative database. So this again was not a prospective study. What you can see, and I highlighted in red, this is comparing infliximab with adalibumab. Crohn's disease-related hospitalizations, abdominal surgery, and corticosteroid prescriptions were significantly less with infliximab compared to adalibumab. Similarly, infliximab outperformed seratilizumab in those same parameters, and adalibumab and seratilizumab were essentially similar. 
So we start to see some signals in comparative effective. The conclusion from this study was that infliximab lowered rates of hospitalization, surgery, and corticosteroids. Infliximab and adalibumab patients were more likely to stay on these agents at a year versus ceratolizumab but there was no difference in serious infections. Therefore, the conclusion of the authors were maybe infliximab is more is a superior to anti-TNFs. How do I position biologics? And this, I put this uh, table in your, in your syllabus. What's the indication? You see are Crohn's, that's largely for insurance purposes. Severe disease, maybe we are getting a signal that infliximab looks a bit better, especially for our inpatient UC. How does eustachimumab stack up after anti-TNF? Safety, we've talked quite a bit about this in reference to vedolizumab. And then the question is, if we use combination therapy, is the safety essentially nullified? I put up here before Adam spoke, concomitant immunomodulators necessary for preventing immunogenicity. This is true in all of the biologic therapies, but I could argue that you could put no to all of these if you're doing proactive therapeutic drug monitoring. Pregnancy, Uma has spoken a lot about this. Sertilizumab appears to be the safest, but all of these at this point appear to be safe in pregnancy. Ability to measure anti-drug antibodies, we have this now to infliximab, adalibumab, sertilizumab, and vedolizumab, and probably over time we'll see this with all of them. Adherence? I think it depends if you want a patient to get IV or sub-Q. And then ultimately, extra-intestinal manifestations. How do we look at this in PSC? Could vedolizumab play a role? MS, natalizumab plays a role if your patient has IBD, and so on. So when we think about our biologic therapies and we think about how positioning these, we have to really individualize the patients, although the comparative effective studies are now helping. Will there be prospective comparative studies? Well, if you don't know about this one, vedolizumab versus adalibumab for UC is underway. So hopefully the data will see this in the coming year or two. Will biologics sequentially be used for remission, induction, and maintenance? So an anti-TNF or IL-1223, then vedolizumab. Will we stack biologic therapies? Will we combine biologic therapies, two different mechanisms of action, now that we'll probably have four or five different groups, and on the horizon are the whole host of small molecules. So what are care pathways? Fortunately, the speakers before me have already spoken about this, so I'll gloss over these more quickly, but I'll give you the idea that care pathways may be, and the comparative effective studies may be, what the payers are going to be telling us in terms of what we should use first and how we should practice. So the AGA has put together care pathways that translate the latest clinical practice guidelines and systematic reviews into user-friendly tools, which you've seen some of them already. I'm not going to show this all again, and I don't expect you to read this, but I decided to show a screenshot of the entire Crohn's care pathway. This is now an app. I have this app on my phone, and you can click through it very readily. It's easy to use, and it's a nice app that will be translating uh, pathways. The UC care pathway has already been discussed. It starts with making a diagnosis and assessing inflammation, assessing comorbidities, and when you click on each of these, it gives you a roll down. Well, guess what? These are electronically in our systems now, and our insurance companies are starting to look at care pathways to decrease variation of care. We can stratify according to risk. I think Gil and others had talked about this. And then look at induction, maintenance therapy, and so on. And there are even care pathways now for ulcerative colitis in the hospital, looking at steroids, infliximab, and cyclosporin. So what does this mean? This means that if you're not familiar with pathways, you will be very soon because these are what the payers, these are what the payers, and these are what the policymakers are looking at. So what is the benefit of this? Well, these are evidence-based data. They do decrease variation in care. So if you have 100 physicians practicing differently, which I dare say most of us practice differently, if you start to use care pathways, we can see this more unified care. This will help potentially the extenders that work with us by following care pathways and evidence-based guidelines. And insurance companies are now starting to utilize these for treatment. Now, will this mean that we'll have easier approval? I wish I could say that, but it's possible through some of these evidence-based data that we'll see easier approval. The cons to this are that not all of our patients fit into these easy algorithms. 
Uh, Gil and others and Coria mentioned there's not a shared decision part of this or a patient preference part of this. And I mentioned that this is, can also be a con from the insurance company side. If they're using the care pathway and you don't agree with that care pathway, and that's what they're using to pay you, we need to be aware of that. And the final question, we're actually doing a lot of computer learning, and the question will be, and not to scare all of us in the room, will computer ultimately be better at treating IBD than we are if we use these algorithms? So finally, in the last four minutes that I have, changing healthcare landscape. What are the new models of IBD care? And I think we've been building toward this over the past decade. And I won't stand here today to tell you that we know what the single model will be. Larry Kaczynski lent me some of his slides on this, and there are many others in the room that I know are involved in these new models. I just don't have time to shout out to all of you, but just to briefly mention his project, Project Sonar, is looking at medical homes with a remote monitoring app using the care pathways that were the guidelines through the AGA to what they call ping patients, so remotely access patients and contact them. And by using these disease pathways, pinging the patients, what they basically found was, and they presented this at DDW last year, that cost went down, total cost, inpatient, emergency room, and even to some degree, the injectable biologic cost. We've been interested in this payer provider model in Pittsburgh, and just to briefly outline what we've looked at, and we are an integrated healthcare delivery system, and many of you that work in ACOs are familiar with this, are probably starting to use and work with your payers closer on population-based care. So these are University of Pittsburgh Medical Center health plan Crohn's and colitis patients, 18 to 50 years of age, whose primary need is IBD, and we become as gastroenterologists their principal care provider. I receive a primary care copay. I'm no longer a specialty copay for these patients. The success of this, just simply put, is the team. It's a team-based approach to the whole patient care rather than algorithmic approach just to the IBD. So we opened for enrollment about a year ago. I, we have a high-touch system. We've done away with centralized scheduling, which I personally think is a disaster, but I get in trouble every time I say that at our institution. We have real people answering the phone, but more importantly, they're asking the patient before they come to the clinic, what are your top three problems, and what three things do you want out of the visit? So I found this funny because this is what a patient wrote, and I'm going to actually show you. A 34-year-old with severe Crohn's. Notice how many times she talks about her Crohn's when she says her three top problems. So if you can't read it, her top number one problem is public transportation in Pittsburgh sucks. Number two, I'm stressed out of my mind. Number three, pain in my bones. This is the type of thing we're not asking our patients. What does she want to get out of the visit? More energy. She wants us to come up with a pill called chillaxin, and she wants a massage. How much of this is algorithmic, evidence-based data care? But this is what all of you are seeing in your clinics, and this is what's driving cost. So we huddle about the patients, we divide them now. We have seven simultaneous rooms. We'll sometimes see 40 to 50 patients in an afternoon. I'm not spending all the time with these patients. This is the team. So in room 18 is Dr. Sigethy. In room 19 in that low-tech red box in the middle is our dietitian, And then I'm in one room, the nurse coordinator, the nurse practitioner. We do a lot of video medicine, telemedicine, try to keep the patients at home. We don't want them to come to the clinic, and they hate coming to see us. So keeping them at home, doing more remote monitoring is key. We look at a population-based approach and we review the patients every week and put them into a red zone. They're doing poorly yellow and a green zone. So just briefly, without going through all the data, we enrolled 347 patients in the first year. Our target was 300 by the health plan. We have 91% retention. And we've decreased emergency room visits by 50%. We've decreased hospitalizations by nearly 50%. Our quality of life metrics have improved. And most importantly, from the health plan payer standpoint, or I wouldn't be standing here talking about this, our total cost of care decreased in the first year, and I'm hoping to present this at DDW. So the final question, are we ready for these new models of care? As gastroenterologists, we weren't trained this way. Are we ready for this? 
So my summary slide to this whole talk is this, biosimilars, we have two anti-TNF biosimilars. I think it's gonna be okay to do this as a new start. The question will be switching and the question will be the cost reduction. Positioning biologics, comparative effective data now exist. Looks like infliximab, adalibumab, and vedolizumab are effective. Eustachimumab hasn't been put in these algorithms yet, but we need to individualize treatment. Care pathways, get used to them. They're coming. If you haven't implemented them in your practice and electronic system, you should and you will because the insurance companies are going to demand this. And I think new models of care are the future. Ultimately, we need to leverage technology for better care. And I can never end any talk without notifying Pittsburgh that goes Steelers. All right, have a good day.